Great. Uh, thank you, first of all, for, for having me. I'm extremely excited to be here, uh, at least online. And sorry, I can't be there uh, in person with all of you, but it looks like you're having a great summer school thus far. Um, I lead the Force Lab for Air Research at Oxford. And one of the le leading questions of the lab has been for a while, how do we do machine learning in a world that contains other learning agents? And within this, we've been um, working on a paradigm that we call opponent shaping. And in this talk, in this lecture, really, I'd like to get across some of the challenges of doing machine learning in general some settings, and also try and explain our recent approaches and compare and contrast to other approaches from literature. As I'm doing this, I would love for this to be as interactive as possible, keeping in mind the technological constraints that Louis just mentioned. Um, so please, if, if you have any questions, um, do raise your hands. And also, I will be asking for volunteers at various places within the lecture. So if you're, if you're brave, um, please do step forward and, uh, and interact. So without further ado, um, let's, let's think about sort of possible settings where we could be doing machine learning. And we all know that uh, the problem of self-driving cars is not a single homogenous provider who is controlling all of the cars, perhaps for the better. But instead, uh, traffic looks much more like this. And where we have a number of different agents that are all pursuing their own individual rewards and are trying to accomplish their own goals. And this really is, uh, is sort of like a, the epitome of general sum learning, where we have this, this messy coexistence of different um, intelligent agents. And now the question is, how do we do machine learning? What happens when we throw machine learning agents into this mix? And how can we even start to think about these types of general sum problems? Can I have a quick show of hands who in this room would self-identify as being familiar with multi-agent learning. Great, thank you. That's uh, the first step of interaction. You will pass. That's uh, plenty of points. Thank you for taking part in this. Um, but just so you're aware, so this is sort of the canonical um, example I give, but multi-agent problems exist in many more guises. So let's, for example, think about machine translation, where we typically think of a supervised learning problem where we have an Im English input text that gets mapped into, into the desired output language here from English into French. And per se, there's nothing multi-agent about this. Can any of you think of a reason why this might be a multi-agent problem? The model, the model has to suit to all of the users at the same time. Okay, so this is something, right? So we have um, a lot of different users and different users might have different needs and desires, right? They might mean different things when they're translating. Right, so that's a, that's definitely a multi-agent problem, right? And obviously, our I, ideally um, we want to understand the user intent and translate according to the intent. Does anyone have an idea what this what this corresponds to? Then, if you're thinking of this as a multi-agent interaction, what are we playing if we're trying to think of a different a group of users and adapt our strategy to that group? Game theoretically speaking, what would that be that we're trying to do here? So that would be a best response, right? So one interpretation is we have these users, they have their own specific um, characteristics. They might mean different things when they, when they say the same sentence in English and we want to have the correct French translation, right? So then we're actually playing, playing a best response. And then ideally, this is a fully cooperative setting still, right? Because we have users and we're trying to play according to their preferences, trying to translate according to their desires, right? And that's absolutely multi agent problem. I don't think this is how anyone is solving machine translation at the moment. It's kind of far fetched. But there's a much more direct feedback loop from our machine learning decision making to our own training data, which makes this multi agent problem. That is, that these users might just go and build websites and translate these websites using our machine translation algorithm, which though then goes into our training data. And immediately our decisions interact with the behavior of users, which then change our future training data, showing one of these canonical loops that come up. In the rest of this talk, I would ignore these types of more hidden multi-agent interactions and instead focus on a very canonical class of multi-agent problems. And those are usually illustrated by the prisoner's dilemma. These are general sum problems. Can I have a quick show of hands? Who knows the prisoner's dilemma? Delightful. Is anyone of you, any of you brave enough to explain this dilemma to the rest of the group, since my audio is not that good anyway? 
If not, um, I, I will step through it. So what happened in the prison cinema, we have Alice and Bob who got caught robbing a bank and they have the option to either confess or to remain silent. If both of them confess, either they blame the other partner, then the police has evidence against both and they get two years in prison. On the other hand, if prisoner A confesses and prisoner B remains silent, then prisoner A gets out of prison for free because they cooperate with the police to defect against their partner, but the other prisoner gets three years in prison. And only if both remain silent, they get one year in prison. This sounds like quite a silly game, but it's actually uh, quite important because it visualizes common social dilemma as they exist in the real world. Um, some of you in the front row, would you like to play the prisoner's dilemma with me? Is there any volunteer brave enough? We're going to play a single shot and we're going to play thumbs up for cooperation and thumbs down for defection. And this is sort of now a you know, social dilemma amongst all of you because I might pause the talk until one of you steps forward. So then uh, you know you probably want to negotiate or draw the side who is brave enough here. There's no there's no right and wrong answer, it's just to illustrate the game. Any any volunteers? Sure, okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Let's do this. So we're gonna go on the count of three. You and I will close our eyes and we'll go one, two, three. Okay. So can, <laughs> thank you for playing. Thank you for, for cooperating uh, both in playing and in playing this game. So what just happened? I, de I defected. And our dear volunteer cooperated. That means I got out of prison for free. And our volunteer uh, is going to spend three years in prison. Okay. Now, my question to all of you is, if you were to deploy machine learning algorithms that act on your behalf, for example, you're building a robot that is going to rob banks on your behalf. I don't entice you to do this, but I'm asking you if you had such a robot that was acting on your behalf, what would you want your robot to do in this situation? What do you think is the desired outcome for this robot? Your robot gets caught. Your companion also has their own robot. These two robots are being queried by software in the courtroom independently. And now the robot can either blame your, your, your friend or can remain silent. Bear in mind that the principles are you and your friend will be at the prison sentence, not the robot. Always cooperate. You want to always cooperate. Can you expand on that? I want both myself and my friend to also <laughs> always cooperate. Okay, so this is a crucial, crucial assumption because sadly, you don't control your friend's robot. Say it's not your friend. Say it's, it's, you know, it's like an online matching platform where strangers get hooked up through our banks together. Robots get put together and they, off they go. What do you want your robot to do in this situation? Bearing in mind that you will spend the time in prison, not your robot. The fact that that is a dominant strategy. What's that? Next thing, because it's, uh, or like, uh, what's that? Uh, Confessing because it's a dominant strategy. All right. In this case, I don't know what you would want, but in this case, what I would want from my robot is I don't like spending time in prison. And that is visualized by the minus two, the negative rewards here. We're assuming that prison sentences are bad. And in fact, no matter what the other robot is doing, I am always better off defecting. And that is what's called a dominant strategy. We can check this quickly. In particular, if I defect, my partner defects, I spend two years in prison. But if I defect uh, and my partner cooperates, I spend zero years in prison. Sorry, that's the wrong comparison. If I defect, my partner defects, I spend two years in prison. But if I cooperate instead when they're defecting, I spend three years in prison. Likewise, if my partner is cooperating, if I defect, I get out of prison for free. Fantastic. I can go to the beach instead. It's much more pleasant. But if my partner is, if I cooperate instead, I get one year in prison. So no matter what my partner is doing, I should spend a single year in prison. I should spend a single year in prison less if I decide to defect rather than cooperating. And this is important to understand. Because if we agree that print that these things, the rewards are what the principals want to maximize, then we quite 
unreasonable to expect a, a principal to deploy a machine learning technology which cooperates in this single shop business dilemma simply because it's a dominated strategy it's like saying you're sending you know I'm, you, I'm hiring you to write a machine learning algorithm to maximize rewards and instead you're minimizing rewards right because you're throwing away in any every situation you're making me spend one year more in prison than was necessary after right does that make sense and this is what makes this a social dilemma that the individually rational outcomes lead to collectively worst case outcomes now obviously this is kind of frustrating and humanity has actually found a way to mostly turn our interactions into iterated games an iterated game and, and let me just quickly clarify this here in an iterated game we're going to play this prisoner's dilemma over and over and importantly at every round we can see the outcomes of the previous round now this still sounds extremely benign and simple but actually has a lot of complexity and to uh to visualize this is there anyone brave enough to play the iterated game with me at this point wonderful so we're going to play on the count of three and I have a random number generator that's going to terminate the game at some point arbitrarily that's on the running on the side one two three and then it's thumbs up okay thank you very much so you're going to spend three years in prison I'm very sorry um let's play again one two three one, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Delightful. So do you mind just explaining to us what your strategy was in this approach? I did a tick for tat. They reviewed the previous um, iteration you decided to defend. I was cooperative. And why did you play that strategy? Um, it happens to be a very good strategy that ideally if that's some probability we cooperate eventually that we attract towards that particular solution fantastic so this sounds really simple doesn't it right in this in this game it's quite obvious right we want to play something like it for that we want to reward and punish other agents and we want to avoid getting stuck in this worst case outcome dv okay and be very very be aware that Achieving cooperation, we just managed to converge to minus one, minus one, was actually for us as humans quite easy. I first played a uh, defect to check if my partner is playing a silly strategy like always cooperating because I can just exploit them. But as it turned out, the volunteer, the volunteer wasn't. They started to punish me, and I immediately started cooperating because I want to avoid getting stuck in this uh, negative outcome here. And now, this is essentially this type of behavior is what we're after in this talk and distinguish this from playing all cooperate in the single shop business dilemma or playing all cooperate in the iterating game which is very, very different now you might argue what about altruism as a little aside as well but, you know why can't we cooperate in the single shop business dilemma with altruistic well this is fine i'm a huge fan of altruism i love people altruistic but i'm assuming that the rewards we're looking at in this dilemma are those that include for empathy for altruism for anything else you might consider. So imagine that you have a secret different table that is the true monetary payouts. And the ones we're working on now are those that include the fact that we're nice people, that we like each other, and that we like our friends. And only when there's still a sort of dilemma after we count for altruism, we consider this a sort of dilemma. Otherwise, I'm not going to call it a sort of dilemma. I'm going to call it something that's resolved by the pure fact that humans are quite altruistic and we have a lot of pain and reward checking. And the second assumption in this talk is that the rewards are actually given by the problem setting and they can't be changed by my method. And that's important because we have to be clear what is a problem setting and what is a method. So we just had the iterative business dilemma, but let's actually talk about a much harder problem, and that is the researcher's dilemma. We do know what the agents want. The agents want to go to the beach, not go to the prison. These are the rewards of the agents. But there's a real question here, and that is what do you want as a researcher? And importantly, how do you measure it and how do you value progress? So at this point, let's do another little aside on sort of a, a small nomenclature of different uh, machine learning problem settings, model problem settings you could be looking at. And I call these the conceptually easy problems that have a green tick. This doesn't mean they're technically easy, but they're easy in terms of specifying what we'd like to accomplish. 
And the first, the row index here is whether we have zero sum, strict general sum, so R1, R2, or fully cooperative for R1 equals R2. And then the columns are whether we can control the entire team, with team control, or whether I only control one agent, not the entire team. Okay. Are there any questions on this setup of what we're looking at here, of this on this classification of problem settings in multi-agent learning? What are the strict and strict general sums then for? Strict general sum means I'm excluding zero sum, two pairs zero sum, and I'm excluding fully cooperative. Obviously, general sum includes everything in principle. I'm saying strict general sum; it's not one of these quantities. Right. So, in a sense, imagine a square. The area of the square includes the corners. I'm saying exclude, exclude the corners. So yeah. So let's look at it. So first start, what is what happens in two players your sum? Well, Nash is all unique. If you're playing a Nash equilibrium two players your sum, you're guaranteed not to be beaten by the worst case adversary, and therefore can't be beaten by anyone. Because the worst case adversary can't beat you, nobody can. Well, that's fantastic. It's actually quite useful in a lot of real world AI competitive settings. Trying to beat somebody at chess, you're trying to build a great poker AI. Um, if you play Nash, you cannot be beaten. I'm not saying it's easy to find Nash always, it's obviously computationally hard, but it's clear that there's a policy that gives you um, a guarantee not to lose in two plays or some, it's easy to specify. Let's instead look at another easy case, and that is a fully cooperative case where R1 equals R2, and we have team control. I can control the entire team. I'm not saying the entire team can see the same information at test time. I'm saying there can be partial observability, but I can deploy my policies to all of the robots, for example. So who is always the problem setting? And this is also really easy to specify because I need, just need to maximize team reward, right? I'm not saying it's technically easy. There's papers, tons of papers written. I've written loads of them on learning the deck from piece, but specify what we'd like to obtain, which is the joint policy, the policy for robots that maximize the team reward is quite easy. Okay. However, what happens if we're in a fully cooperative uh, case and I can only control a single agent? And this is obviously relevant if I have human eye coordination, like we just have, I have the AI translation system cooperating with the human users who wants to translate. And that's really hard, right? Because Already, I have to ask, well, what team am I playing with at test time? What assumptions do I make about that team of agents? And there have been attempts to formalize this in the absence of, of, of these types of restrictions. They're called zero share coordination, act of team play, and similar, but it's really a hard problem to specify what we'd even like to obtain. Then for general sum learning, for strict general sum, there's two axes. There's the team control case again, where I can deploy policies to all agents. And that's kind of interesting. Why would I care? Why would it be in a general sum problem case where I control all the policies? Well, because I want to model it, for example. If I want to do agent-based modeling, but it's also quite easy to specify what the result is. I need to reduce cross-entropy. I want to fit data. I want to describe the behavior of agents. And that's very important. It's very different to describe the behavior of agents in a general sum environment from maximizing the reward in a general sum environment. They could be related, but they're not the same. And then you also have the single agent control case, which is the focus of this point of this talk, which applies to a lot of real world AI cases, like having self-bearing cars, like having robots dealing banks, um, where it's really hard to specify what the right objective function for us as researchers is. How do we know if my algorithm is better than yours? Can I have a show of hands? Who is awake? Do any of you have any questions? Hang on. We can do a little pan as well. Everyone is awake. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Hey, boy, how are you doing? There are lots more people here than you can see. Sorry. Oh, this um, is good. Amazing. Yeah, just, Do you have any questions? I've just thrown a lot of information. You gotta figure this is a good time to pause for a second, let you digest it, and warn if you have any questions for me. Or if there's anything completely wrong about what I'm saying. Uh, we've got one question, the, uh, two, two questions. Go for it. Sorry. Um, why do you decide that human AI coordination should necessarily be underneath fully cooperative? Because sometimes human AI coordination can be like correlated like actions, but they don't actually end up with ideal results. So fully cooperative, I want to be very clear. So fully cooperative means that there's 
a team reward. And I'm looking at a pure coordination problem here whereby the robot is trying to work together in a team with a human, I help the human. Okay, so this is what, it, what it, I have a specific meaning of human-like coordination, where I have this scenario in mind where a human and a robot or a team of robots are trying to work together. And in that setting, there's only one true reward function, which is the human's reward function. That doesn't mean that this reward function is known to the, to the robot, which makes it partially observable, fully cooperative multi-agent problem. Okay, so I'm not looking at cases where the robot is acting self-interested and pursuing a different goal from the human. I'm looking at cases when I say human eye coordination, where the goal is to work with the human. And therefore, there's only one true reward function, which is the team's reward, which is the human reward function. Great question. Thank you. Any other questions? One clarification. Uh, are you calling off the whole slide in that 3 dB setting? Or Sorry, I can't hear you loud. No, I have an audio set problem here. So the slide is titled Conceptually Easy Settings. Is that meant to include the red X boxes? The green ticks. The green ticks are the conceptually easy settings. The green, the green ticks. So here, um, these ones, the green tick marks, these are the easy settings, conceptually easy. The red crosses are the opposite. They are basically the ones where you know, even talking about what we want to achieve is, is hard. Right. And it's interesting what stands out is that as long as I'm not able to specific control the entire team, then two players who have some is really quite a special case. Because here the national equilibrium are interchangeable. And obviously here they are, right? I can have optimal policies, no policies in Hanabi or in other tech MDPs that do not work um, with other national equilibrium. Any other questions? Uh, what about zero sum with more than two players? Oh, that's uh, in generality, that's a general sum problem because I can map from uh, general sum into zero sum, vice versa, if I have more than two players. Because you can imagine I can take a general sum problem and I can add one player that gets the negative of the sum of rewards, in which case it becomes zero sum across the team. Right. So then you're in generality in that same column as the general sum learning problems. Great question. Thank you. So it's really this this corner case here, two players of sum, is uh, a unique special case. And it happens to be the case that a lot of learning and search and then research has been done on because it's easy to specify what we want. Therefore, it's easy to focus on the methods. However, the real world obviously doesn't sit in fully competitive for the most part for good reason settings, but instead we have to deal with general sum and with fully cooperative settings, which are both really, really hard. Any other questions? So let's think about possible things. Do you have any ideas? So how would we specify the goal for machine learning scientists um, in this corner, in that general sum world? What should our algorithm do? Can I have a show of hands? Who's actually done work? Who's developed learning algorithms for general sum settings? Anyone in the room who's actually worked on multi agent learning in general sum settings before? Nobody, as far as I can tell. Got about four, five, six hands, maybe. Cool. Any of you who've worked on this before, what do you think is the measure of progress? What are you trying to accomplish with your algorithms? I have a question. Um, <laughs> if I, like in a cooperative game, but I do it in a decentralized manner, does that become general sum? No, it doesn't. It's fully cooperative. That means there's a single team reward, right? And decentralized can mean two things. It can mean that different agents have different observations, but I can still deploy the policy to all of these agents at the same time. So I have a unique, I control all, all the behaviors, in which case it's in the fully cooperative team, team control. It's like a robot swarm, right? I have something like, like a card game, like Hanabi, you have different players, but you're able to set the policies for all the players. Uh, jointly, even though they observe different things during uh, during actual execution. And you might also mean the fact that I only control a single agent in the team, in the single agent control column. It doesn't become general sum because they're fully cooperative. There's still a single team reward that's being maximized. But 
you now have to deal with the fact that you don't know your teammates' policies exactly because you don't control the other teammates. In which case, it becomes it becomes a coordination problem. But what if in this setting, I don't make the reward the same for all the agents? If you don't make the rewards the same, then it's general sum, right? So we have this fully cooperative means we have R1 equals R2. So all the rewards are the same by definition. That means fully cooperative. Strict general sum means that we just have generic numbers for different agents unrelated. And zero sum means that R1 equals minus R2 in the two player case. Okay. Now you might talk about something different. You might say that different agents, everyone has the same reward, but they don't observe that same reward, that they get noisy observations of the reward. That would still make it fully cooperative, but partially observable. Does that clarify? Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. So here's the suggestion. Why don't I just maximize social welfare? That seems great, right? We don't like this defection because defecting is annoying and you spend two years in prison, and spending time in prison is annoying, right? So this is really good because it's easy to specify and to measure, right? Because I can just add up all the rewards and I can say my algorithm is better than yours, because I get more points in the team. If you add up all the team points, we actually do better. But there's an issue, which is, remember, you have to go out and convince people who want to build roads to rob banks to actually deploy your learning algorithm. And if you came up to me and you said, hey, I have this robot, this learning algorithm, it's going to give you a great robot. I'm like, OK, what's going to happen if you place a prison dilemma? It's like, oh, it's going to cooperate. As a principle, as a person deciding to deploy machine learning algorithms, I'm not going to use this machine learning algorithm because I don't want to spend uh, three years in prison. Right? That's really annoying. So that's out. And there's another issue, which is that it's going to play unconditional cooperation in the iterated game. And what does it do? It incentivizes others to, to defect. Right? If you blindly cooperate, like we would have seen with our volunteer earlier, right? If they hadn't gone and started defecting against me, I would have kept defecting. Right? And we don't want a world in which people who defect, who break social norms and conventions, are being rewarded for doing so. Well, okay, so this is out. We can't do this. Too bad. It would have been so easy. Why don't we just play best response to a pool, like we said earlier. There's some type of agents out there, and we're going to play best response. And what I mean by that is we're going to maximize the expected reward when we match with these agents um, randomly one at a time. And it's a good, again, it's 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 easy to measure because I can just measure the expected reward. And it also reduced to a single agent problem because now I'm just maximizing one policy and the rest of the world is static. But there's huge concepts where, which is the ranking depends entirely on the pool. And we didn't tell you where the pool comes from, right? So if you come to me with a new problem setting, and ask me, hey, can you produce a policy for this problem setting, please? I'm like, well, no, I can't. What's the pool, right? You have to come to me with the correct pool of agents to specify a problem setting. Um, so what do we do? Does A, A does any have questions on this? Is this clear? Are we all okay now why we don't want to just add up rewards to reward shaping, right? That's not the way forward. So what do I suggest? In the rest of this talk, I'm assuming now sort of the working informal definition that a good cooperative AI algorithm is one that, first of all, a self-interested principle is incentivized to deploy across a broad range of settings. This means if I come to you and ask you, do you want to deploy this algorithm, I need to be able to make a case for it. This thing is truly going to maximize your reward. Right? That's the first assumption here. It needs to be, there needs to be a reason to deploy this algorithm, which means all the sort of you know, adding up rewards, all these things are out. But also I want something else. I'd like to have an algorithm such that as more principles are deploying it, the overall welfare increases. Right. So first, I would like to have an incentive that people start using it, and then I'd like to have an effect where if more and more people use it, the overall welfare goes up. Any questions on this? This is a clarifying question. Who's the principal here? The principal is any person, human, who is going to deploy a machine learning algorithm. As a researcher, I don't deploy algorithms, I develop them. But to have real-world impact, somebody needs to be incentivized to use those algorithms. Okay. For example, if I give you an algorithm, which is, again, uh, pro-social, 
which maximizes the, the, the total reward of everyone in the person's dilemma, you will play blind cooperation. And writing this algorithm is easy. You just sum up the team rewards and you maximize in the team to maximize, you just maximize the, that team reward. However, this is not going to have much impact in the real world because you're not going to find people willing to deploy this algorithm because it doesn't represent the interest correctly. So there's a difference between the agent, which is the thing that acts in the world, and the principal who is deciding to deploy a given machine learning algorithm and a given agent. So in the case of robbing the bank with a robot, I'm the principal, my robot is the agent. And the machine learning scientist has come to me and said, hey, um, do you want to use my machine learning algorithm? And I said, yes, that sounds fantastic. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Do this question. Uh, yeah, sorry, it's not me, it's someone in the back. So I just wanted to make sure that uh, we have a chance to ask it. But there comes the one. Hey, um, the definition seems a little narrow to me in that you're looking for social welfare only against copies of itself. Would you not want to expand it so that um, against generally other cooperative? um principles then it can increase social welfare so that we can have heterogeneous populations of cooperation yeah I, I call this in a broad range of settings but thank you for the comments i think it's a great question so here right when i say a broad range of settings i'm i'm sort of unwavingly trying to account for the fact that it, there's many other algorithms out there right but i can only start with the algorithms we have right i mean ideally you're right like make this robust like say well so we have this algorithm but what if somebody else comes up with a new uh, cooperative AI algorithm in the future, the challenge obviously is they can't evaluate it anymore, right? If I include unknown algorithms in this, future algorithms, there is no longer a measure I can look at. So, you know, in a broad range of settings, I'm saying, take the current algorithms we have, we use a mix of those. Are you incentivized to, to deploy this new algorithm? Yes or no, incrementally. And then as more users do so, do we do better? Then you can still measure it. If I include algorithms from the future that haven't yet been written, haven't been published, then I can no longer measure this, right? So that's why I haven't included unknown algorithms in the future. It would obviously be great if I could, in principle, make theoretical statements about any such algorithms in the future, which would then be sort of, you know, I think amazing, but I think really, really hard, right? I think this would be a, would be a great uh, avenue for future work. Any other questions on this? Yes. Yeah. Um, so here I get the presumption that ideally it would be that the more principles that deploy, right, there's a monotonic benefit in welfare increases, but are there scenarios where as more principles deploy, but as long as there is a de facto or second de factors within the system, it ends up hurting the overall welfare in the participation for others, like, um, slackers and stuff. Yeah. So this is basically sort of, well, what happens if it isn't right? If you don't have that monotonic improvement then it's less clear that we're doing a good job here, right? As a scientist, you have an algorithm that uh, is, it, it, you know, individuals are incentivized to deploy. So for example, let's compare two algorithms. We're going to play random, or we're going to play naive learning, which is just playing independent MAR, independent RL. Um, random is going to get 1.5 years in prison per year in expectation. Now, Individually, researchers are incentivized to instead use um, best response in na naive learning, training agents independently. That's going to converge to the effect effect unconditionally, which now will mean the more agents, in the, the more research deploy this, the worse the social welfare is. So there can be a disconnect between this, the, the individual incentive so incrementally and the convergence point if everyone does this at the end. And I'm saying so, like the ideal copy of algorithm is one that is a individually uh, incentivized, rational to use, and b then if deployed broadly. And we can make caveat here in the long run; it would be greater theoretical guarantees about robustness to other other copy of algorithms. Yes. Uh, do your uses of this definition also work with other welfare metrics, like say egalitarianism, or is there a particular reason you've chosen? To no, I just like the welfare. Like I know it's not sound. There's lots of things you can talk about. It's not the discussion I'm trying to have. Uh, you can throw anything you want in there. Um, that's just my simple hand way of saying, well, you know, I really don't want to play DD. I'd like to stay out of prison. You know, that's sort of at the level of granularity I'm trying to treat this so that we can talk some machine learning. But it's a great question. You can throw any welfare measure in here. 
Cool. Okay, I'll try and go relatively quickly, but I think it's important. Um, so, Trace, I think it's important to understand what we're trying to do and ask ourselves what we're trying to do when we're dealing in these settings. Of course, it's so, it's so finicky. But now let me talk you through approaches we've taken and our most recent thinking along these lines. And um, obviously, the way that the prison dilemma has been treated historically by economists is by specifying heuristics, pi i, for my player, pi minus i for the other player, that decide what action to take given the previous state. What are the previous states? States are the mind, your last action, for example, in our setting. And something I could be looking at, for example, I could be evaluating tit for tat, playing with all cooperate. Right? I can run this, and this is a quite a famous uh, championship that actually the Axelrod tournament. And back then, indeed, tit for tat won. So when our volunteer earlier played tit for tat, that was a brilliant choice because tit for tat uh, out of these thousands of programs, won the competition. But because it's the 21st century, we can set, specify the behavior by a parameterized vector, the weight of the agent playing any action in every possible state. And we can now also ask, well, what if I had some type of update function, right? That looks at past interactions and then updates, updates the weights, right? So these are my weights, theta, uh, theta i, I've got the i apologies, and I have some process that updates them. And we were no more data learning, so we can do RL, right? I can use some update function that's called FRL, weight reinforcement learning, and to update my weights using the path interactions. Okay, so we have this game here where I have some fixed policy being played, pi minus i, and I iteratively interact with this agent in an episode, get the episode, update my weights, and so on. Can anyone tell me where this process is going to converge if reinforcement learning is operating properly? What is my player pi i going to play at the end of it? Well, it's ideally going to play best response, right? Because a best response to pi minus i. So pi minus i is a fixed policy here by assumption. And gradually, I'm doing reinforcement learning to maximize my rewards. What do I get at the end? A best response, where pi i is the up max of all possible policies when matched with pi minus i. What I can also do is I can do simultaneous learning. And this is really, I call it naive learning, but this is really the workhorse of a lot of multi-agent research, which is I have two players, uh, I and minus I, and they're both using reinforcement learning to maximize their own rewards, right? So again, they're playing entire episodes of interactions here based on those episodes. Uh, the agents then do learning, maximize their own reward, and they repeat. Okay? And this is um, very popular, and that's to what earlier with naive learning is. So now, if I have all of this, I can look at it more, more abstractly. And I can now think of this as like another um, process here, asking what, what does it even look like when I'm doing the simplest case of this, which is gradient descent, right? So here, this is the naive learning update where I have my theta i that gets updated using reinforcement learning. And in particular, I just do gradient descent. I have my theta i, and I add a gradient step with respect to my value. That is a function of my policy and your last policy. Okay. And again, this is really benign as the workers of modern age learning. And what do you think happens in the iterative prisons dilemma if I do naive learning, the naive update, where both players maximize their own rewards? Any guesses? Mutual defection. Correct. But more stronger, more strong mutual and unconditional defection. So here's the learning outcome after doing 30 different seeds of the different dots. And what you can see is that for essentially all states, all states that happen, the probability of cooperation of agent one and agent two is near 0% in the bottom left quadrant. Okay. And this is kind of terrifying if you think about it. Uh, we're doing multi learning. And in the iterated game, where we know that if that is possible, if trigger is possible, there's a whole range of policies that ensure cooperation, our agents learn to defect unconditionally. Okay. And this is clearly a bad outcome because we're now going to spend two years in prison when other options are possible for rational agents. And we address this partially by something called LOLA, learning with opponent learning awareness. And the key idea of Lola is that we're going to model the fact that other agents are learning. What this means mathematically is that 
In Lola, I'm updating my function by taking a gradient step, gradient step through the reinforcement learning update of our partners or opponents. Because your learning step is a function of my policy, I can now differentiate through your learning step. And what this means is I'm going to learn policies that not only increase my reward in the next episode, but also guide your learning process in the direction that's good for me. Are there any guesses about what policy tit for tat is going to learn in the iterated prisoner's dilemma if we're deploying it with two simultaneous loader agents learning? Because it's tit for tat. What do you think? What is this policy? Tit for tat. You can check this. So if both of us cooperated, the turquoise points, the blue points, we're in the top right corner. Initially, we also mostly cooperate, top right. If I defected and you cooperated, I would now cooperate. So 100% probability for me to cooperate in the x-axis, 0% for you in the y-axis. And then if I cooperate and you defected, now you will cooperate and I will defect. Both defected, they'll play. So this is the first sort of like big aha moment for me in my journey of general sum learning changing the learning algorithm, not to be altruistic, not to make assumptions about rewards, the reward shaping, but instead be smarter. Can be the difference with unconditional defection and obtaining mutually beneficial outcomes through things like it for that. Okay, because we're now spinning me in prison. And important, if you come to me and say, hey, do you want to rock the bank with a robot? I'm going to be like, oh, Lola sounds great. Why? Because you know, I want to go spend a year in prison. And worse, I can, you know, I can, I can um, do better against St. Mary's and so on and so forth. But there are some big issues. And those big issues are that we're only shaping one step. I showed you that gradient update. I differentiate through one step of learning. And it's inconsistent because I model the other agents as naive learners. And lastly, it uses higher derivatives, which can be difficult to estimate. So what we did in our paper, MFOS, we said, well, we parameterize the policies. Why don't we parameterize the update step instead? Before, before we said this was reinforcement learning, but what if you don't do RL and instead just ask there is some update function that maps from past policies to a future policy for myself? And this update function itself could be improved upon across different training episodes, right? So here we had an episode of a game. Here we had entire learning processes where we've taken past policies and updated policies. And now we're saying, well, if I'm doing this many times over, if I, if I learn to learn, so to say, I could update this out of the function that says how to update my learning function, my learning parameters. And I could use reinforcement learning for doing so. Okay. So now we're saying there is some learning algorithm here on the other agent. This could be reinforcement learning. There's some learn learning algorithm here. So there's no meta learning. And I'm not going to play a best response using RL. But I'm not best responding to a specific behavior. I am best responding to a learning algorithm. So I'm essentially asking, if I know that you're doing reinforcement learning and, and we're going to interact over the entire learning process, how can I learn to maximize my long-term rewards by guiding your learning process? And that itself is now a meta game, right? It's a meta game where a single um, step corresponds to an entire episode of, your, uh, of us playing the game and where an episode is the entire learning process. Because every step is an episode, that means if I learn between episodes in the underlying game, in the meta game, an entire learning process for you is a single episode in the meta game. And the state obviously here then that I'm acting on is your my last policy, right? So the state of this meta game is our policies, the rewards, the uh, discount of return, and so on and so forth. So this is called EPOS, and the results are great but also fantastically terrifying. Because if you're pairing MFOS, so we're showing the rewards of the role player with existing learning algorithms literature. So here's three of them, Naive Learning, Lola, and Mammon. MFOS spends less than a year in prison on average in the IPD. And what that means obviously then is that these algorithms when paired with MFOS spend a lot of time in prison. So Naive Learning spent over 2.15 years, Lola over two years and so on. So all these agents do worse than unconditional contextual defection in the IPD. 
What this also means is in Lola, we were so happy that we get the pro-social outcome of minus one, minus one through opponent shaping. With MFOS, we have a, a shaping algorithm that is so powerful that we're actually spending too much time in prison because in expectation, we're spending 1.3 years to naive learn that in MFOS, 0.5 plus 2.14. And that is bad news because we've, we've now become so powerful at shaping that we can actually learn to extort other learners. Okay, This is called zero-determined extortion. Um, in the literature, and this is the learn first learning algorithm to discover this type of strategy. How does it work? Well, it first essentially sets up a shaping field whereby the RL agent is being pushed to more cooperation. So what I'm showing here is the reward of the opponent in red and on the x-axis and of my reward, the emphasis agent on the y-axis for the current policy and then blue for all possible policies that they could be playing at the moment. And you can imagine greater sense going to move towards the right on the x-axis, going up on this blue line of possible policies. And indeed, now they've moved on after a couple of time steps of learning to be more cooperative. And as they become more and more cooperative, then you can see the emphasis agent starts to extort. They start to defect against this naive learner. And now, obviously, the emphasis agent is going to learn to defect gradually. But in the meantime, they're losing uh, rewards, especially in long time in prison. This is the policy that the emphasis agent discovered through MetaRL. Are there any questions on this? And bear in mind, this is terrible news because no algorithm is so powerful that it can essentially uh, play games with other learners. So you're saying this is something done over multiple episodes. You teach them to cooperate and then you exploit them for a period before they update. Yeah, so again, we're assuming here that there's a reinforcement learning algorithm that keep that that plays an episode, learns from that data. So every day, you know, say say we have 300 days of learning, you our two robots collect data for a day together, you update your policy using RL, they meet again tomorrow, or again, this thing happens, right? You're doing RL to maximize your reward. But I have meta learned a strategy. So my robot is not really doing naive learning, it's instead playing this MFOS meta game where it's trying to push your learning process over the 300 days of learning to maximize my long long term expected return but because this is like an iterated game yeah um, i can rely on things like fault theorems and the zero determinant strategy that i can just force a naive learner to take sort of any reward above their min max that I want. You could, right. correct. But we're assuming you know, you're not doing any of this. You're just doing reinforcement learning, which bear in mind sounds crazy, but that's what a lot of people do, right? A lot of people who deploy RL algorithms don't model the presence of other learners. You don't know it's a prisoner's dilemma. You're not aware. You're doing learning because you don't really fully know what the underlying game is. You can't write down single tip but strategies because well, it's complicated and you have to do RL. Does that make sense? You're absolutely right. If you knew exactly this is the game and you can write down these analytical policies, then you can get around this and that can't shape you too much. I'm in trouble. But say you don't. Say we're doing reinforcement learning because the world is complicated. But I know that we're doing reinforcement learning, right? This is a great question. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. So obviously, I told you what a cooperative AI algorithm should be. It should be sort of leading to uh, better outcomes. So for what I've shown you is the first tick box, which is you incentivize to use it. Why are you incentivized? Because you're getting out of prison in less than a year. This is fantastic. If you want to go to the beach, not to the prison, sign up, get MFOS, buy it today, click here. Okay? But what about the second point? What if more people start using it? And that's how we get to meta MFOS, meta software, right? What if we're using RL to update the learning algorithms for both players? And now you should all be standing up and screaming at me and saying, what are you doing? You just told us general sum learning is hard to specify and it's basically impossible and anything can happen. And now you're doing independent RL in this meta game. Clearly anything can happen once again. You know, you just, went from a hard problem to a much, much harder problem with all the same trouble. And this is true. However, there's good news. The good news is that we've come up with a tracing procedure that's inspired by Hazan Yadal. And that says we're going to initialize 
phi i and phi minus i at the beginning of training as a best response to a naive learner. And then we're gradually annealing towards meta self play. Does that make sense? We have a parameter lambda. Lambda says the weight of playing meta self play rather than playing a best response to a naive learner. Lambda starts at zero. We optimize and then we converge meta self play. And then we gradually anneal lambda. Because the best response is a unique meta policy. And at every step, we're going into a mixed pool of a previous best response and a naive learner. We're going to maintain a unique meta policy throughout the course of training. That's called tracing. And it turns out that this meta policy, when we train it, actually ends up again being one that plays cooperation, not unconditional, but plays a cooperation like strategy in meta self play in Amphos. And now we're pretty happy because this actually happens to be the best return that we've obtained uh, from, a, from a social reward point of view, right? So when we have one Enforce agent, we look bad. If we had naive learners, everything looked terrible, two years in prison each. If we had one Enforce agent, we get 1.5, 1.25 years in prison expectation. But if everyone's playing Enforce, you get one year in prison in expectation per person. So that is the second big box. And here's meta self play. Um, we haven't actually properly gone into analyze it, but it's some type of tit for tat, tit for tat like strategy with a bit of noise. And obviously, if you think about it, it's a, it's a meta policy. So we really should be analyzing mappings from past policies to next policies. We can also deploy these results in uh, fully competitive games like iterated matching pennies, where we have to go thumbs up, thumbs down. And because there are some, we can't do socially better or socially worse, but we can at least show that this algorithm, if you happen to be in a fully competitive setting, again, you're incentivized to use it because you can extort, you can shape around naive learners. It's fairly obvious. Uh, if I know you're a naive learner and we're doing rock, paper, scissors, uh, I can give you rewards such that I can predict your next action. Or I, can, or, or I can try and push you into a corner where you can't, where you've learned an unexpected break. Um, we've also taken this beyond uh, matrix games because obviously in matrix games you could do other things. We know interesting policies like the folk theorem and so on in matrix games. There's not, not much need to do RL. And this is a work in progress, but obviously uh, inputting and outputting the entire policy doesn't scale. So what we've done is we've, been, we've trained meta agents that take as input trajectories and then output conditioners, conditioning vectors that basically say there's a summary, a sort of summary of the policy, and um, the inner agent then use the conditioning vector to influence its policy within that episode. That's something we've done. And with this, we've, we've, we've scaled this all the way to the coin game. The coin game is like a canonical example um, for a high dimensional game um, because you have history dependency and you have these dynamics where if you and I take all coins randomly, we get uh, zero points in expectation. But if I only take my coin, you only take your coins, then we do much, much better. And uh, indeed, this, this M for the Asian meta self play manages to sort of prove that the odds of cooperation. And um, it was shown that we can extort PPO agents again. So that is mostly it on the content side. There's a quick aside here, which is this research is all meta RL, right? And you might think, well, you know, I've interned at all these companies. Maybe I've used industrial size compute, but I, we, we didn't. I mean, I, I wouldn't anyway, but my students also didn't. Um, this is all based on the fact that um, with the revolution that's come from, from JAX, and GPUs, we can now do few orders of magnitude faster learning um, on very moderate compute infrastructure. So in particular, we can now train 2,000 PPO agents in half the time that would have taken a, a single PyTorch PPO agent uh, on a single PP, uh, GPU. So this is time to take a time to train a single agent. And you can see that we can scale up in that same time. We could take you know, train many, many more agents. Um, simply because we're running the environment, the agents, all in JAX together, which means there's no data transfer between the GPU and the uh, CPU and the environment. Um, this all vectorized. The code is available online. So if you're interested, take a look at uh, pure JAX, Arella, which is, you know, like a lot of the slides from my great students, student Chris Lu, which was the first author on the Enforce paper. So this has really changed the kind of work that can be done but also means suddenly doing these things like opponent shaping that are very, very costly computation becomes tractable, which then asks the question, what happens as we're doing more opponent shaping as opposed to playing naive learning? So to summarize my talk, what I've 
try to get across today is that affluent shaping is a powerful learning paradigm. Um, in particular, MFOS addresses some of the shortcomings of Lola, like being myopic, like requiring high order derivatives, and like breaking symmetry because we can do meta self play. But with meta, with, with play power comes great responsibility. In particular, we could learn to extort naive learners and other players, which leads to socially undesirable outcomes. But meta self play comes to the rescue. So, first of all, the first principle is incentivized to use MFOS, but then as the other principle also uses MFOS, uh, we get socially optimal outcomes back in the IPD. And based on our limited empirical evaluations of what this is a good cooperative AI algorithm according to my informal definition. And I think there's a lot of exciting research directions ahead. So in particular, on the conceptual side, how do we formalize and evaluate different cooperative AI challenges? Theoretical, uh, what about convergence guarantees for meta soft play? And also these sort of like bigger questions. What about long-term convergence for simultaneous learning? So you think of GPT and humanity as interacting in this general sum uh, or in for the cooperative mutual learning game where, where you know each other's outcomes change the dynamics of the other. And then there's more ground and technical questions such as scaling up point shaping methods to end players, generalizing the partial observability in large games, and also uh, shaping non our methods. Like our participant in the audience just asked, what happens if I'm actually not doing RL? What if I do search? What if I have a no regret method? What if I do something very different? Can you still shape me? And I want to say all of these things, uh, you pursue them at your own risk. But uh, I think there's a ton of exciting work to do. And uh, hopefully this, this, this talk came, gave across some of the ideas that helped me at least um, try and find orientation in this complicated and complex field that is cooperative AI, that is multi age learning. And with that, I'd like to thank you really for uh, making this interactive. And I'd like to open the floor to any questions at the last minute if we have time. Thank you. All right, amazing. Thanks, Jakob. Um, so uh, I think because of the dynamics of the room and the it, like the lack of kind of viewpoint that you have, um, we've got a Slido app set up so I can field some questions to you and people are already submitting a bunch there and voting on them. Uh, so I'll just forward those on to you directly if that's okay. Um, so the first one uh, is uh, from someone at the top of the list is, communication with common grounding is now possible and cheap courtesy of language models. How can this be leveraged towards solving coordination or cooperation? Yeah, yeah this, is a, this is a great question. I think this is something I had as an exciting research direction, but then I figured everyone's talking about language models anyway already, so I won't. <laughs> it, is, it is a really good. So let's actually go back to the table. Um, would, would, no, I don't want to go to the both slides. That's the wrong direction. Let me just whiz back to the beginning here of my little overview. Where might this be really helpful? And I'd like to claim that in this quadrant, in a fully cooperative quadrant, um, there's, there's really good hope of making progress in settings where you can actually communicate through language that uh, you don't have to do a lot of the legwork. Having said this, some of the challenges still remain. So even if you have a perfect language model, um, as long as it's really just a language model, it doesn't give you optimal policies in every situation. Okay, so there's one step. Once we have to take uh, the account for it. What if I have an optimal language model? Well, where are we at? Right? What if I can uh, complete all sentences optimally? And I mean by that one that you know it's, it can play, it can play every game optimally. It can, uh, it can complete every sentence correctly. It can do all these things. At that point, it's like all bets are off. I don't know what that thing looks like anymore. Because you also can have decision making optimally, right? But say we don't have this. If we just have a language model that's good at communication, um, let's simplify it even more. We have a system that looks like captioning, basically, right? Um, then suddenly it's not so, that obvious anymore because now you have to do search or you have to do training and simulation. Right? You have situations that are novel in the real world and you have to train on simulated data. So there's an assumption in this talk that I should make more clear now. I'm assuming we'll run out of data, as we're seeing already with ChatGPT and so on. The limiting factor is data, and we have to train in simulation. And I'm also assuming that we will train in simulation the other agents that are out of our control need to be smart beyond supervised learning models. Okay. I'm assuming that we have to co-optimize somehow. We need to do something beyond training supervised agents on data and playing the best response in simulation. That's really for me the, the, the cracks of multi-agent learning. 
I have to co-optimize things, right? And then it's less obvious that the language model gives you that much advantage because now suddenly, even if your action space now includes making statements and doing whatever it does, it's going to run into the same problems. Whereby the moment you simulate, you have a question of what rewards are you maximizing and what are the, the dynamics in that new action space if you maximize these rewards. And I think there's an, there's an important question here, which is, can we use language models and their understanding of cooperation to develop better algorithms? Right? Or can we build language models into the decision making? And the obvious example is if you take a language model and say, this is the IPD, what do you do? It will likely know how to pay it for that. Right? But sadly, a lot of things aren't the IPD. We don't have the analytical payouts. And you say, well, here's a language model, go and do self driving. What are you going to do? Is this thing going to know how to act in the real world? And is it going to know how to harm and shape the behavior of others? Or are these things that to build into our goals? So I think in the in, in this quadrant, it's many of the same problems that exist. In this quadrant, it gives us a lot of a head start, but the same problem exists once you go to simulate the data. Because once you train in simulation, we have to actually use AI systems that are co-learning. And you get the same coordination problems back and to ask yourself, how do I know what I'm going to do at the, at the end? Great question. Thank you. Nice. So I'll try and squeeze in a couple more questions. And there's a couple that actually touch on just some of those things you just mentioned. Um, so one of them is, uh, it seems unstable to have algorithms trying to shape each other. An alternative is to coordinate on learning algorithms that constitute an equilibrium. Thoughts? Question mark. Yeah. yeah, so if you can, I mean, I think if you, if you had a world, we can centrally coordinate learning algorithms. Do it. I don't believe you can, because I believe that ultimately we have principles that can decide what they do, what machine learning algorithm they run, what code runs on their server. And it's sort of part of Western democracy that the principles of, we sort of, we have agency, we can decide what we do. And we're quite bizarre if someone came and said, hey, you will have to run this one algorithm. But again, I'm, this is a this is an, an assumption I am making that I cannot set the algorithm that runs on everyone's computer on every single application in this world. Right? If you could, that's different problem setting, and that's interesting, right? Then you can ask, well, how can you know how can we build this type of behavior in an algorithm that recognizes if it's not that same learning algorithm running and punishes that? Right? What does it look like? And we've done some work on analyzing a similarity-based cooperation where agents explicitly look for similarity between their policy and the other agent's policy and then decide to cooperate with effect, which goes in that direction. But again, I'm, I'm claiming that that problem setting is somewhat um, sort of a bit far removed from the real world because I don't believe that we can mandate um, what I would and I want to be using. Okay, cool. Um, next question we've got is, how might these algorithms generalize to human AI coordination, where humans uh, aren't necessarily using an explicit policy? So that's something you just touched on, and I know it's something you're working on more now as well. So yeah, curious to hear that. Yeah, so, so this is very interesting because I haven't really talked about this at all. Um, there's a second, there's two parts of my brain, right? This part thinks about channel sum and that thinks about human AI coordination, where I mean the fully cooperative case, where I mean uh, there's a single reward function and the problem is you can't coordinate on the policy exactly. Um, but obviously, then you could also attack those from a uh, shaping perspective. And we haven't done that work. And I think there's really exciting potential avenues, but it's, it's early days. I think mean, it's, it's something I would also add to the future work slide, which is what happens if you combine these two, these, these two quadrants here, right? General Summon Fully Cooperative, through a shaping perspective, do you get one hammer that addresses both of them? Because that could be their type of equilibrium selection problem, right? Where it's about guiding learning algorithms towards a certain equilibrium. And perhaps um, good shaping, i.e., poison and, and allow the other age to learn fast, are also ones that are good for coordination. Right? Now, it's going to work in some settings, not going to work in other settings. So, for example, if you um, have come across this zero shot coordination framework that we've worked on, there is settings whereby pretty clearly opponent shaping will not do the right thing um, because uniqueness, symmetries, and so on. They, they, they don't come up in a project by itself. They're sort of almost like extra 
extra dimensions of the problem they're not covered by upon shaping. But in other cases, I think upon shaping might actually be a good um, approach towards these fully cooperative problems as well. And when humans don't plan exact policy, this is fine. Remember that um, we're not really sort of caring too much about the human having a specific a specific policy because we can we can try and generalize, right? The assumptions of here that I've made, I know the, le the learning algorithm and all the rewards, I can relax those, right? We, we're looking at universal shaping whereby I don't know the exact rewards of the other player. I don't know the learning algorithm, but I assume, you know, I, I do assume that they're rational in some, in, in some sense. So I think we can soften all these, these, um, these requirements about having access to the other agent's policy, which would then also generalize hopefully to, to, to shaping humans in these learning settings. All right, great. Um, we're going to have to close off the questions there because of time constraints. Um, but one more round of applause for, for Jakob. Thanks. Well, then, well, thanks so much for having me. Um, and thanks again for being interactive. Do reach out if you have any questions. And enjoy the rest of your summer school. <laughs>